All right. How many of you are ready for Christmas? All right. Let me just see. Now, here, let me explain what I mean. I don't mean ready like you've got everything accomplished ready. I can see people being reticent to put their hands up. How many of you feel like you could use a little Christmas? Right? And I don't know. I don't know. Especially, I feel this year, maybe more than in other years, I feel ready for Christmas and feel like there's a need for it. I don't know whether it's the fresh, cool air we're feeling right now and the color of the trees. Or, no. Or uh, maybe, maybe just it was a long year with the election cycle that never ended and we're just all kind of tired of that. And we just feel like we need a little Christmas right this very minute, right? So, you know, we're all getting ready. How many of you uh, have your lights up already? Anybody with lights up? How many of your tree up? Okay, how many don't care right now? Okay, <laughs> all right. How many of you, uh, it is your tradition that on Thanksgiving weekend you, you get all the stuff out and you do the deal? Some people are, okay, hand, handful of us, okay. All right, that's great. Well, I'm just kind of checking because ready or not, right, it's coming. And whether you're ready or not, it's going to be here before we know it. So uh, I want to show you a little bit. Uh, many of you all know we were away last weekend. Uh, we went north uh, to, for Thanksgiving up to Kentucky to visit our older daughter who's in seminary there. We flew our younger daughter in, and we flew Beth's mom in and had Thanksgiving uh, in Kentucky. It was 21 degrees up there. So, yeah, I mean, not even joking, right? I want to show you some pictures. Here we are here out in front of the seminary. This is uh, all of us there, and then there's Beth. Of course, she can't keep her hands off me, so <laughs> there's that. And then uh, one of the things Beth really wanted to do was Beth wanted to, she said, Dale, when we go up there, we're going to drive a 1,000 miles. It's literally like a 1,000 miles from uh, our driveway to the seminary. And she said, I want to find a Christmas tree farm, and we're going to buy our own Christmas tree, and we're going to bring it back. We've never done that before. And so I want you to know, I was like, uh, I'm a native Floridian. I'm like, a 1,000 miles will, like, it work? And she said, trust me, it'll work. So I've got some pictures here. Here we are out on the tree farm. Look at the beautiful trees there. There's Brandon, our little tag along, because he loves Haley. There you go. And then, um, yeah, and then here we are. You can't see it, but there we are. We put the Christmas tree is actually in my truck, and we drove 1,000 miles. Here's the tree after we got it home. I want everybody to see that. No, that's actually not our tree. But I was, I don't know, I was a little nervous about it. I was like, man, I, will it make it? And, and it made it. And so it's great. We're all, I'm still married. It's all good. It's all good. And uh, so anyhow, that was kind of a thing that we were doing to kind of kick the season off. And oh my gosh, it's Christmas time, right? Here we go. So uh, this morning, what I want to do is uh, I want to begin a conversation with you. Uh, I was thinking about some things. I don't know if you feel like I feel, but I feel like this has been a, a unique and different and at times challenging year. Anybody feel that way? Yeah, and I just feel like, man, I am ready for some celebration. I am ready for Christmas. And uh, a while back, I was doing my devotions, and I ran across a passage of Scripture. It's not a Christmas passage of Scripture, but it challenged me. And it was the pen of the Apostle Paul, and he's writing this in Philippians chapter 4. This is what he says. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And I, I just was kind of struck in that moment that a lot of my thoughts have not been those thoughts this year. Anybody identify? A lot of my conversation has not really been that conversation. And I felt the tug of the Holy Spirit saying to me, I, so I want to change your thoughts, and I want to change some of your conversation. Well, I started thinking about that. I started thinking about all of the table conversations, the table talk, and I came up with an idea. I thought, what if in December at Community of Hope, we didn't have table talk, we had stable talk? Oh, I thought that would be better than, I don't know. Maybe it's just my idea, but I thought that would be an awesome thing. So like what if in December we opened our lives to the Holy Spirit and we said in December, let's, let's let our, 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 how, see how our lives might be improved by our speech made more wholesome, 
our minds transformed by what we encounter. And let's, let's welcome some stable conversations into our ordinary everyday conversation. And this is what I started thinking. I thought, you know what? What if we go back in the scriptures and we start looking at all the different stable conversations in the Bible about Jesus' birth? And we looked at some of those conversations. And we tried to glean from some of those conversations some stuff that we all need to experience and to know and to live our lives kind of orbiting around that kind of stuff. I can tell you're tracking with me right now. This is awesome. Okay? And uh, so I started thinking about this, and I thought, you know what? Let's, let's, go, let's do that, and let's begin. Where would we begin? What would be the first stable talk we would have? What's the first stable conversation in the Bible? Let's begin at the very beginning. It's the very good place to start. That's what Julie Andrews says. I just spent a week with all girls, okay? So just you're going to have to live with it a little bit. And I thought about this passage of Scripture in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah's writing, and uh, Isaiah is a prophet. And uh, so here's what we're going to do this morning. This is where I'm going to need your help. We're going to do this a little interactively. I'm going to take it down a gear, and we're going to do some, some, I'm going to do some teaching to lay some track for us to run on in December. Is that a good idea? So you're going to want to reach in, grab your message, your notes page. We're going to take some notes maybe. And I'm going to lay some foundation over some things that Trevor and I want to talk to you about in December. But today's a little more teachy than it is preachy. I hope that's okay. And uh, so uh, we're looking in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's a prophet. And uh, I want to read to you an, uh, really an un known, unfamiliar passage of scripture, and then one a little bit more familiar, and I'm going to teach my way through it. So if you have your Bible, you're going to want to follow along. You've got a smartphone. We're going to go all over the place today on a journey in about 20, 25 minutes. So here it is, Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at, beginning at verse 1. Here's what the old prophet writes. We're entering into the middle of a conversation here, and he says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. For in the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. For the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in a land of deep darkness a light has dawned. And then a little more familiar verse down in verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. For the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, let's, let's do a little learning together, a little Bible study. This is the old prophet Isaiah. Many of you remember that there were these 12 kingdoms or 12 tribes, they were divided. And the two, uh, 10 tribes of the northern uh, kingdom, I think of Israel, the southern kingdom, two tribes were Judah. They were dispossessed people of Israel, carried off into captivity. Now God would at times raise up prophets to speak to these people, to speak to his people words that they needed to hear, all right? Now, when you think about biblical times and you go back into biblical history and you go back and you look at that and you do some reading in that, that makes total sense. We talk about prophets today and it seems kind of weird, but you go back then, oftentimes those were established positions, sometimes of great honor, sometimes not, but sometimes still of great honor. And a prophet, primarily biblically speaking or historically speaking, when we think of a prophet, a prophet primarily would do two things. They would function in two ways. I want you to be familiar with that. Again, I'm laying some foundation for us across the whole month. You'll like it, I promise. And so when we think about this, here's the first thing I want us to remember. Prophets were, first of all, something called forth tellers. And here's what forth tellers did. They told us hard things that we needed to hear, even if it was uncomfortable, to help us remember what is most important. Now, think with me a minute. Many of us have people in our lives that have come along at just the right time and said, hey, you should be focusing on this. Or they said, hey, word of warning, 
be careful there. Or hey, I've been where you are and let me tell you what I remember from that experience. Those are people doing this. They are forth telling into your life. And let me just say as a side note, every one of us in this room and listening online, we need forth tellers in our lives. We need people, this is my phrase, you hear me say it often, we need people who love us, but who are not impressed by us, who are willing to tell us what we need to hear. And that's what a prophet would do. They would speak out warning. They would speak out areas where we needed to hear things. Now, here's the thing. It's important to go when we're doing that today, go where we're invited. Don't go where you're not invited. But here's the thing. Every one of us in this room and listening online, we should have people that we've invited into our lives and said, I give you permission to tell me what I need to hear. And if I'm going off in a different direction, I need to be reminded of what the right direction is. That's a prophet. Prophets were foretellers. Now, here's something else, though. Prophets were also foretellers. Very interesting. A prophet, biblically speaking, was also a foreteller. And foretellers are people who, uh, of God's plans, speak about God's plans before they happen. There are people anointed by God to say things, watch this, in advance. Very powerful position. In fact, that's the litmus test of a biblical prophet. They can just tell things before it happened. Now, think with me about this. Scholars would tell us that Isaiah wrote those words 700 years before the birth of Christ. 700 years He was saying, you know, that we're walking in darkness, a light is dawn, someone who's coming, and they're going to be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and their government, their rule will never have an ending 700 years before the birth of Christ. Okay, so watch. Here we go. Bible study. We we have this era of the prophets. The era of the prophets is over. Biblical history moving forward. We have 400 years of silence. Where, where there were no prophets, nobody was speaking out about God. God's representatives were not there. Then we get over into the era of the New Testament. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospel of Matthew, written by a Jewish believer to the Jewish people, reminding all of the Jewish tribe that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus begins his ministry. We go to Matthew chapter 4. The the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness is over. He begins his ministry. We pick up at verse 12. I want to read to you what happens right in verse 12. It says, when Jesus heard that John had been in prison, he withdrew into, look at this, Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Sound familiar? To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Here we go. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Sound familiar? What's going on right there? What do we need to remember? What do we need to focus on? This is Jesus saying, hey, everybody, I'm the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy spoken 700 years ago. Don't look any further. It's me. Now, when I think about that, there are three things that really come to mind, and I want to share them with you as we begin this journey, uh, this Advent season here at Community of Hope, and we have these stable talks, these stable conversations. This is the first one. This is the first stable conversation. And I want you to notice very clearly what I think Isaiah is wanting us to know in his prophetic utterance of Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 this week. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7 next week. You're not going to want to uh, miss that. But here's what I think he's saying in verses 1 and 2. Write this down. The world is dark. 
Jesus is coming as the light, and we will only find our way if he becomes our light. The world is dark. Say it with me. The world is dark. Jesus is coming as the light, and we will only find our way if Jesus becomes our light. Okay? Now, here's the thing. First of all, here's what I want you to notice. Let's just pair it apart just for a moment. He talks about darkness. Now, you and I don't need to be reminded this morning when we're in here that the world oftentimes is a dark place. Do we need to be, really need to be reminded of that? We don't need to be reminded of that. And I think it's interesting that Isaiah says not only that is there darkness, but I think it's interesting that he says there is deep darkness. And I don't know about you, but I think uh, we just have to look at our culture and sometimes we can look at our culture and look at our lives and realize just how accurate the biblical description of darkness really is. We see injustice, we see racism, we see hatred, we see addiction, and we go, man, the world's a dark place. And uh, when I think about what he's saying here, and what, one of the things that I notice, here's what I want everybody to remember. Whenever the Bible speaks of the absence of light, it speaks of two things. It speaks of ignorance, and it speaks of evil. So when, whenever in the scriptures it is talking about the absence of light, it is talking about ignorance, and it is talking about evil. And sometimes, I think you'll agree, it's our own ignorance left unchecked that will maneuver us toward evil. That's what happens. And we find that over and over again in the scriptures. Now, I want to say one other thing again. Bible study on, right? So here's, I told you when I read these scriptures at the beginning of, of my time that um, we're picking up in the middle of the conversation. Here's Isaiah in the middle of the conversation saying, people walking around in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now here's the thing, middle of the conversation. You go back one chapter to Isaiah chapter 8, at the end of chapter 8, and you begin to see the darkness that he's pointing to. I want to read it out to you. You maybe want to write down the reference and look at it later. It's Isaiah 8, 19 through 22. Here's what Isaiah writes. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Why? Consult instead God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they're going to roam through the land, and when they're famished, they're going to become enraged. They're going to look upward, and they're going to curse their king and their God. And then verse 22, they will look toward the earth and themselves and see distress and darkness and fearful, be fearful and gloom, and they'll be thrust into darkness. Here, what, what is Isaiah saying? If you're not careful, you'll be tempted, like our culture does, to think that we can possess the light in and of ourselves. Okay? Now I want to make a switch for a moment. He talks about darkness, and I'm so thankful, hopefully you are too, Isaiah doesn't leave us in the dark. He says, not the dark, but then he goes, then out on the other side of that, the people walk, walking in darkness, they have seen what? A great what? Light. And on those walking and living in the land of deep darkness, a light has what? What does it say? A light has what? Dawned. You notice what he's saying there? Here's what he's saying. The light comes from the outside. It doesn't come from within. A light has dawned. It's coming from another place. You and I go out of here and, and we're going to be told, especially in this season, what do we think of oftentimes of December? December is the season of light. I want to tell you a little pet peeve I have about the church often. Sometimes I hear Christians and we talk about December and, and we'll say things like this, well, we got to we got to resist all the commercialization. And I agree commercialization can go far. And we got to resist all of this celebration around all this stuff. And, we, and I agree we can, we can get carried away. But if we say that loud enough and if we say that often enough, I just want to tell everybody, it sounds out of tune to our culture. Here's what I think is more in tune. We ought to be the ones leading the celebration. 
because we know what the celebration is. This is the season of light. And, and, and I want to tell you what, I think we have a God who loves celebration. We have a God who loves light. And we as followers of Jesus ought to be the ones who say, you know what, whatever we see in the world in that regard, it's just a small reminder that the light doesn't come from us, it comes from another place. And whatever light we might manufacture, it's just not enough. I remember when I was very young in the ministry, um, I was taking a lot of notes from guys who had been in the ranks a little bit longer than I was. And I remember I served near a guy uh, that was serving a church, and we would get together and in some settings every now and again. And, and I always took note uh, of him in December in particular. He was not a happy guy. This is a pastor. And he said one time, he goes, I don't really like December, and, it, and there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and he said, uh, and it, but he goes, we don't, we don't really party. We don't get into all that stuff. He goes, in fact, in my family, we don't exchange gifts. We give to missions. And I remember being a young minister, and I remember thinking to myself, is that, is that what I should do? Because at that time, do you all remember, we had, we had a little girl, Haley, and Haley wanted that, that play school, was it the car, the yellow and red little plastic car, remember that? And I was, I was searching high and low to find one of those, and more than anything else, she wanted the gas tank that went with the car. <laughs> and I remember thinking, gosh, should I not be looking for that? And, I, and then I began to study his life and look at him, and he didn't seem real happy. And then I looked at his family. And they didn't look real happy. And I thought, man, you know, you give to missions. I wonder if you ever sat down and asked your family, do you want to just give to missions? Here's the thing. Why don't you do both? There's an idea. Now, that's what we're going to do in this December. But here's my point. See, we should be leading the celebration. I think every one of us should charge out of here. Our home should be lit up the best. We should win all of our neighborhood competitions. <laughs> Why? Because we know where the light comes from. It doesn't come from within. It comes from another source. Those of us living in deep darkness, a light has dawned. So what's the message of Isaiah? Here's the message of Isaiah, you know. It's not, it's not this. It's not, hey, you have the power. You got it. You got stuff going on in your life. Just try harder. Just do that. It's not, here's this. Isaiah, that's not the message. Here's the message of Isaiah. It's not, hey, be indifferent to darkness. It's okay. In fact, every time darkness is mentioned in the Bible, you know what God's people do? They resist it. We're never indifferent to darkness, the absence of light. We resist it. Why do we have the compassion experience over here? We're pushing darkness. Right? Hunger's not a good thing. You know, being so poor that you can't feed your family, that's not a good thing. The body of Christ rises up and goes, that's injustice. Push. Boom. That's what happens. But the message isn't you got the power. The message isn't there isn't darkness. The message is the light comes from another source. When John was writing of Jesus, I want you to notice what he said. He said in, in John chapter 1, verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. Jesus comes along a few chapters later, and it says in John chapter 8, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light, look at that, of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. What's he saying? You don't have to walk in ignorance. Hey, you don't have to walk in evil because Jesus is the light of the world. That was a great spot for an amen right there. So last night uh, when Beth and I got through the service, we went to get a bite to eat. And then we stopped at Publix. Every single one of our dates end at Publix. <laughs> if I went on a date with my wife and we went home, I'd think I was with another woman. <laughs> and so we were in Publix and we're getting groceries. 
And uh, I see this guy go breezing by me, and I think I recognize him. It's a guy that comes every now and again here. A guy for whom life is not going really well. And I could tell just by the disposition and the, and the way that he, his body language that he was avoiding me. Sometimes you guys avoid preachers. <laughs> hey, sometimes preachers avoid you. <laughs> just saying. Trevor told me to say that. <laughs> and so I, I saw him. I saw this guy, and I, I, said, I told my wife, I said, sweetie, hold on. I, I said, I recognize somebody. And I, I walked out there, and I said, hey, hey. And he turned around, and he looked at me, and he kind of perked up a minute. And I said, how you doing? And everything about him said, not good. And so I went over to him, and I was talking to him, and I said, man, how you, I haven't seen you in a long time. You, you doing all right? And his eyes moistened up, and he said, you know, I'm not doing good, Pastor. And then right there, he, go, he just said, you know what? Would you pray for me? And I said, I'll, yeah, right now. And so like right there by the Clorox and the sponges. <laughs> I mean, this. And I had my hand on his, around his shoulders, and he had his hands around my shoulders. I could tell people were going around us. But here's the thing, I started praying for him and I started praying for him about walking in the light. And I want you to know that I could hear him underneath my prayers saying, yes, Lord, help me do that. Please help me do that. Here's the thing I want everybody to know. The darkness is real. Jesus is coming as the light. And our only hope is to let him be our light. Have you done that? And I don't know about you, in my life, I've learned I have to do it often. I don't think it's a one-time gig. I find myself often going, Jesus, help me not be so self-centered. Lord, guard my mouth to say encouraging things. Lord, discipline my mind to stay honorable before you. Help my actions to represent someone who is walking in the streams of light. This is what he wants. Now, I got to say, I think it's so appropriate that we'd have our first stable conversation while the table is laid out before us. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, the Bible says he took bread and after he had given thanks to the Father, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this bread is my body given for you. And whenever you eat bread in this manner, remember, the light doesn't come from you. I'm bringing the light. And the Bible says that after supper was over, he took a cup and he gave thanks to God the Father. And then he turned to the disciples and he said, this is a cup that represents my blood. Imagine him saying that. It'll be shed for you. And these were people steeped in a religious tradition of bloody sacrifices. And then Jesus went a step further and he said, I'm establishing a new covenant right in front of everybody. And he said, neither will there be a need for many sacrifices anymore. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to be the one sacrifice, the one full final sacrifice for all the sins of the world, your sins and mine. And so my challenge this morning is we always think about, I want you to take a minute and examine your heart and be ready to receive communion with reverence and with honor. But make a part of your experience this morning the opportunity to thank Jesus for the light he wants to bring to your life.
that you don't have to live in the absence of light. Because when light shows up, we see things clearly. We can tell the truth because we see it. It brings warmth and life and color. And this is what he wants to do with every life in this room. Jesus, I pray for my friends. And as we prepare our hearts, would you bring your presence here in a special way? Would you remind those of us whose hearts are broken? Would you say a word to those of us who are living in areas of darkness? Would you say something to us who, like my friend, are very discouraged and life is not going well? That you love us and you care for us. You're making a way for us. Do something here, Jesus. We are relying on you. Be honored by the reverent way we receive unto these gifts. In the name of Christ.